I want to welcome you all to this maiden edition of the program and we hope that you will enjoy and start to pick up tips and understand the journey of cancer survivors across the globe irrespective of the type of disease. So today in the house I have three of us cancer survivors. Um, we'll be talking about it and we're using this opportunity to make people understand that people still live with cancer and still have some sort of good quality of life irrespective of the disease. So I'd like to welcome on Firstly, Anastasia, let me introduce you properly. Anastasia is a stage 2 breast cancer, triple, that's what it's called. It's a stage 2 triple negative breast cancer survivor and a widow with three children. And she enjoys singing and reading. And Kali, Sun Kolia Obi, is a stage 3 breast cancer survivor. She's a woman with a dynamic vision of reducing cancer and mortality rates and creating awareness. My name is Denise Edjo. So within the four of three of us here today, I am what you call a stage four breast cancer survivor metastasizing in the brain with this disease metastasizing in the brain. I'll explain to you what metastases mean as we go along. Welcome. So ladies, how are you today? Fantastic. Very well. Well, Very well. Thank you. now let's sit down and let's have a chat and make sure that we get the message out and help save lives because that's the essence of all of this so very briefly i'm going to ask you both to share your story um and let us understand so that we can pick up the differences and i'll share mine as well so my journey started in 2018 when uh, i was um to be precise march 2018 when i found a lump on my left breast i was very enthusiastic in going for my holiday and didn't um, think about the the lump. So what I did was I thought, okay, I would it, it, it possibly would not be anything. And by then, my mind was never on anything cancer at all. I'd, I've never thought about, oh, it could be cancer, it could not be. I've never even heard. Cancer wasn't something that I was too familiar with, even though I've heard the word cancer. So I went on my holiday, got back, and I um, got a letter to speak to my GP uh, to do what is called a smear test, which is for to detect if there's any um, kind of cervical cancer. So I did say to them, oh, I found a lump on my left breast, and it's quite big and um, it's solid. So they asked me, can you come in immediately, which I did, and um, to cut the long story short, uh, I went to the doctor, he looked at it, referred me, and I did, I went to the hospital, I did what is called a mammogram, which was, um, it's a, a machine x-ray to check the um, uh, the size of the lump, if there's any lump at all. And they detected a lump. And afterwards, I was asked to do what is called a biopsy. So they took out the tissue, sample of the tissue to do, um, to take to the lab. Uh, went back. And I was told it was um, stage three breast cancer. And lo and behold, what did I do? I told the doctor to cut the breast off immediately. Thank you. I'm going to stop you here. So I'm going to give you a briefing of my journey. And my journey was very easy. I was also not, I was actually, to be honest with you, all I had was a headache. So I'm not going to say it as if it was a big deal. I had a headache, a headache that just wouldn't go. I did all the tests and went through, I mean, hospitals all over Nigeria, from Abuja to Mina, where I was living, to Lagos, to about four hospitals in Lagos. And no one could tell me what was the cause of the headache. And eventually I had um, a doctor say, you know what, everything looks very okay with you, Denise. We can't find anything but... So we are sure that we have addressed it. We are going to do an MRI scan. And lo and behold, we had cancer that had spread. No. So how did they put it? You had, they say you have lesions. That's it. That's what Nigeria call it. They call you have lesions. So I said, what does that mean? They say, well, it's more than one. I didn't understand all that. And I just thought, you know what? I'm out of here. And I left and came out to the UK and found out that I had to have brain surgery within seven days. Having brain surgery was where they picked up that it was. They didn't know it was cancer because once you see more than one, apparently I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a patient of cancer who has become very, very knowledgeable. Um, I'm a teacher. 
let me put it nicely, I'm a teacher. Because I like <laughs> being a teacher. <laughs> and then I found out that I had breast I had breast cancer metastasizing in the brain. Collie, what's the role of family in supporting this journey? Family actually should play a vital role in any cancer journey. But sometimes that's not the case. Uh, so you find out that sometimes some people shut, shut, um, shut out uh, family members from uh, go when they are going through this when they are going through this journey. So uh, when I mean shutting them out, it doesn't mean you know not whatever. But at the end of the day, they tend not to tell them. Especially if you're going to be getting kind of a negative vibes from them. Mm -hmm. We decide, okay, these are the family members I know that when I say X, Y, Z, or I've got cancer, they would not judge me and they will hold my hands to go through the journey. But their family members, when you tell them, in my case, I have somebody who is supposedly to be a close family member when I told the person, the person asked me, where did you get the cancer from? So you see, when it comes to family, you have to be careful. For me personally, I have to be careful who I disseminate the information to. So when I was going through my journey, I know how my family dynamic works. So the only people that knew I was going through cancer treatment were just my sister and my mom's younger brother. Uh, it's very interesting because family, friends, I think there's going to be one common thread amongst all of us, and I think it's amongst all cancer patients, is things that are said at the time of diagnosis. And a lot of people not realizing the impact of what they say at that time, I remember somebody saying, who sinned? <laughs> and I thought, really? As a Christian, he was even a pastor. So I can imagine. And that's why I asked you, because I'm coming back to another question and I'm waiting for her to come on. Uh, would you say um, cancer is <laughs> stigmatized? Would you say what? Cancer is stigmatized. Yes, I would. Why? Why I would say cancer is stigmatized is um, when they see somebody who's gone through cancer, the way they treat that person is totally different from the way they treat maybe somebody who's gone through malaria. And again, the, most people are very myopic in their thinking. So sometimes they think cancer is, um, what do you call it? It's... Uh, Contagious. Contagious, yes. So they tend to stay away from you and try to, you know, avoid you. And when you come out and say, oh, um, I've been through cancer, they'll be looking at you. Okay, maybe it's the sins you committed that God struck you with cancer or maybe it's uh, your past life or whatever. So by the time they start, unless you allow them to label you, and that's why you find out that most people don't come out to say anything. They live within their sh within the shells of themselves. So, uh, yes, cancer is very stigmatizing. Thank you. Interesting, because I don't think that a lot of people realize that. And a lot of good intentions come out of trying to care for people with cancer, thinking they are good intentions. But we still... We have to accept a lot of people walk away from you. Um, a lot of things are said that are very hurtful. A lot of people don't navigate the journey properly because of lack of knowledge. I always stand that, and that's why awareness is very key. So I'm going to talk about the cancer disease itself now. Um, uh, talk me through your treatment. The first uh, thing I had was uh, the removal of sample of the lymph nodes. So it was 
I did a surgery on the local anesthet uh, anesthet um, anesthetics. And it was a day surgery and where they took out samples of the lymph nodes to test. Afterwards, I had the big one, which is the mastectomy, and which is the removal of the breast, where I had my whole breast chopped off. Then uh, on the same day, I had what is called a reconstruction. So they took tissues from my, uh, from my body and reconstructed, a des I have a designer breast. So <laughs> super proud of it. What the devil thought, you know, uh, that the devil thought we used to. So in the process of it, I had to get a boob lift to make sure that the reconstructed one, which obviously will be firmer than the other one, synchronizes with the new one. Afterwards, I had chemotherapy. I had eight cycles of chemotherapy, which was the most dreadful one because I lost, um, I wasn't afraid to lose my hair because I thought, okay, I've heard, I was warned you could lose your hair, that ex, um, your, your nails could turn black, you will lose your taste and everything. And ev all of it I experienced. But to be honest, when I was going for my chemotherapy, my eyelash was on flick. <laughs> Even when I had my dreads, as soon as I finished the first cycle of the chemo, by the second one, I saw one dread had already fallen off. And I went to my brother and I said, can you shave the hair? And I shaved the hair properly. And I wore my wig. So anytime when they see me coming for my chemotherapy every three weeks, they're asking me, are you going for a party? Are you going somewhere after this? I said, of course, I'm going somewhere after this. I've come for a cocktail. So what do you expect? You have to look pretty to come down there and not look gloomy. So, you know, I, I, I was more like putting Bob, uh, smiles on the faces of the women there. And it took a turn because there were some other younger girls when they are coming, they're just coming on, uh, you know, just like that. Let me just come and get this now. But I noticed some of them, one girl went to do her nails. And when I saw, I was like, what's going on? She said, you taught me how to come to, to come to take chemotherapy and I've taken the steps. So, and I had a radio, I had, um, a one month, one full month of radiotherapy. And after that, I'm now currently on what is called a hormonal medication, tamoxifen. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Anastasia, very briefly, can you summarize what stage two breast cancer is all about? Thank you. Yes. Um, stage two triple negative breast cancer doesn't have a receptor. Uh, like the doctors told me, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I started off with a lump. I had a mammogram biopsy and that was all brought out um, the stage and told the doctors what way to go. I was told I'll have four cycles of chemotherapy and then a mastectomy. That is the complete removal of the breast. I did that. At the second stage of my chemotherapy, my hair started falling off. And so I had a complete shave. And after the fourth cycle, I went for the mastectomy. I don't have a reconstruction, but when I dress up to go out, you don't know I have only one breast. And so I, I have um, decided to tell people that cancer doesn't kill if you detect early and if you receive the treatment early. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can say this. Uh, to those of you watching us and listening to this, we are trying to make this discussion quite light because a lot of people are afraid of the word called cancer. Cancer, yes, can be a killer disease, but doesn't have to be. And we want you to know that you don't have to fight on your own, so long as you know what you need to do to get through this journey. Uh, I'm going to talk about mental health because one of the things that we've had is the challenges to do with mental health and um, there's a, because of the denial, let me put it this way, because of denial, I think we lose more people and statistically, globally, one in two people will get cancer all over the world. Um, when I was at the World Cancer Congress, it was also identified that 2%, 2.4% of Africans um, are the ones that live, they remain um, so in currently we've got 80%, 70 to 80% of um, cancer, cancer patients do not survive in Africa. 
So I'm going to ask you a question now. Looking at your journey, and both of you will have a shot at this, looking at your journey, give me one or two things that you would give to you would give as a tip very quickly to anybody that is going through cancer. Two tips I'm going to give uh, mm -hmm. in respect of um, to people going through cancer. It's number one, when you're going for your cancer treatment, have a positive mindset. That's number one. You must have a positive mindset. And number two, do not live in denial. Tell yourself the truth. When the doctor says X, Y, Z, take it back, process it, and tell yourself the honest truth. Fantastic. Okay. Mademoiselle. Anastasia. Two okay, tips I'll you. give. Yes, two tips I'll give. Surround yourself with positive vibes. People who are positive, um, people who will tell you they are ready to go along with you, not people who will who, who will want you to fit it. A lot of Nigerians or Africans, you know, they, they, they want to fit it. Um, it's not my portion, it's not my portion. If you are diagnosed with cancer, face it and then surround yourself with positive vibes. Two, eat well. Be happy. It's not a death sentence. Thank you. So I'm going to add to you. And my two are, be honest with yourself. Yep. And I would say why. I have stage four cancer. Stage four cancer means it has metastasized. So I said I will explain to you the differences. When cancer has metastasized, it means it has moved from the origin to somewhere else. And what I have is breast cancer that has moved from the breast to the brain. I have undergone three, three cuts to the brain. I have had over 10 tumors removed from the brain. And I'm still here. So, focus is what I'm saying. And listen to your body. Your body tells you when you are sick. Cancer is an everyday illness. That's how I put it to the layman. That means it can be a headache. It's headache that got me here. It's nothing. There's no lump. They've never found a lump. It's a persistent headache. People who have um, head, um, colon cancer, it's continuous diarrhea or constipation you know so i'm saying to the general public no matter anything that is persistent that is the rule anything that does not stop that you take medicine it stops and it starts again can be cancer mm -hmm. so please if you find yourself with a persistent illness and it's everyday illnesses so not all this complicated named men, men, it is like cough cold that's the type and headache and diarrhea those are the type they do con they start to build and can become cancer so before you find yourself in um, stage two please make sure that you know that stage one and two apparently is curable totally curable so once you are in a small pace please try and address it we agree awareness is pivotal mm -hmm. so what do you think give me one thing that you think we need to go forward for the general public so you tell me, each person, uh, Anastasia, you go first. One thing we need to go forward for the general public. Um, in, in Nigeria, where I live, uh, funds are very, very scarce. And religion uh, is a bane. I, I think we should start the awareness from the pulpit. Let us start letting people know that everyone has cancer cells in them. Everybody carries cancer cells in them. It is only the ones that now become uh, um, malignant that, that, that need to be, to, to be addressed. And mm -hmm. so we, we should have that, that um, consciousness, you know, of uh, um, always wanting to, um, I, I, I think, go for checkups, basically. We, we, don't, we don't do that. So my belief is that we start from the grassroots, and the grassroots for me is the rural areas. Talk to the women who don't understand English. 
speak to women who are selling pepper. These are the people that when it hits, it hits hard. And by the time they present to the hospital, it's too late. So awareness from the grassroots. Okay, and where would I come from on this one? I will come from it from a totally different um, thing. I would say that um, all stakeholders make sure when decision is being made, cancer survivors are in it. It was shared even at the World Cancer Congress in 2022 this year that there was a drive, or there is now a drive, that in the entire running of cancer issues around the globe, cancer survivors should be part of it. And so committees that are being formed are now taking on people who live with the disease to be voices. Because unless we talk, a medical doctor does not know what we are feeling. I am taking chemo as I'm talking to you today, and somebody else will look at me and think, oh my God, she's taking chemo. So, yeah. So, what's the big deal? It is not, it is a big deal because we do have a lot of challenges that go with us. So, how do you think we should do something differently? One thing we can do differently. I think that there should be a way in which there is a register of all those who provide support and to be checked, so check mate that we only we have less than 100 oncologists, qualified oncologists in Nigeria. If you ca calculate 100 and then the population, you know that we are very understaffed, which con immediately raises the alarm that that means a lot of people will be taking cancer treatment from non-specialists. Yes. Okay, so we need to think about how to work this differently. And to do that, I think we need to recognize the power drain that is going on in our country and how that is going to be resolved by the government, by all stakeholders in making a difference for the lives of cancer patients. Okay, and I says, yeah, you go for them. Um, no, uh, colleague, go for this one, please. What, we, uh, what I think we can uh, do differently is to for um, when patients go to the hospital, for them to be more involved in their treatments and to be able to ask questions. What I found out is that most Nigerians, I'm going to use Nigerians uh, because they are the most widely people I've dealt with, most patient, uh, cancer patients in Nigeria do not ask questions. Most of them, when you ask them, the f my, usually my first question when I meet somebody is what stage and what grade? Most of them don't know what stage. Most of them know, don't know what grade. So when you don't know the stage and the grade, how do you navigate your treatment? And when you go to a doctor and you're able to pose questions that they are unable to deal with, that will automatically tell you that you're not dealing with an oncologist if you're very clever. Most cancer patients, whether newly diagnosed or, or, or in, con or in um, active treatment or in remission, in quotes, mm -hmm. should be involved in their treatment, fully Thank involved. Thank you. Anastasia, can you give me your own view? Yes. I'll say we'll separate facts from fiction. People are sick, they go to church believing the pastor can do perform a miracle. And like Kolya said, we as, um, uh, 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 as people in remission who have once gone through the treatment should be a part of the treatment. We, we, we are stakeholders, so we should be a part of the cancer patient's journey, the cancer patient's story. Separating fact from fiction is actually very, very key. And I've come to realize that it is a point where we don't always get it right. So now as we draw to the end of this, um, I'm going to give you one of everybody an opportunity to give, uh, give advice. Um, either advice to a cancer patient or speak to the government or speak to the population as to what you think, what strategy or improvement whatever that will make a difference for a breast cancer survivor in Nigeria and across the world. 
cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence. If you notice any change in your body, please go to the hospital and listen to what the doctor says. When I was diagnosed, a lot of people became doctors. They told me not to take chemotherapy. They, they, they had one negative thing to say about chemotherapy. We should start, you know, the, the government should start getting hold of these people. They are killing people. Oh, okay. Colleague, go on. So, um, my advice would be to the government. Uh, don't wait until people start dying before you take a decision. You see somebody who's come to uh, to you, and you've told you would categorically tell the person you have to drop twenty five million naira for a start. And when you're looking at the person, the person is not even worth up to 5,000 naira. Where are you expecting the person to get the funding from? And this is why people resent back to churches, to taking herbs, to taking different kinds of all sorts of nonsense just to say they are curing cancer. And the government needs to step up to do something. Uh, either they reduce the cost of treatment for people who go to the government hospital, reduce the cost of treatment for them, or subsidize it. Listening to your views, both of you, I really appreciate it because one of the things I think people don't realize is that a lot of people will look at me now sitting on this screen and be wondering, <laughs> this woman, she's just enjoying herself. But if they had the opportunity to see what I have looked like over the years with my bald head and very big, my head was very, very big, only because I had to take steroids. And to have to go through that every time, every two years, and then have the cuts and then take the steroids and the head now becomes two times the size and is very heavy. It's a very interesting experience that a lot of people do not even know cancer patients go through. The illnesses that come with it and everything, it's left for us all as, as survivors as patients to just keep a positive, please, a positive mindset. Learn to laugh through your pain. Learn mm. to praise through your pain. Learn to thank God through your challenges. And trust me, um, you, it only gets better. No matter what it says, no matter what the decisions are finally, you've got to find space in yourself as a survivor or as a patient, because all patients are survivors until the day you go home. I want to say thank you very much for joining me on this today. As we get to the end of the year, it is the aim that we make people know what to do, how to do it, and get through, because together we fight, together we win. Join us on Komod Cancer Foundation on this program and watch the videos. They will be shared online for you all, and you can share it, because awareness is key. The more people know what to do, and know where to find information, the better it is for us to reduce the challenges and reduce death mortality rates across the globe. I want to say thank you all for joining us on this maiden edition and look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>